got your uh, Bibles, uh, we are going to be in the book of John this morning in our series in John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8, we're going to be starting that chapter, we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses this morning, and on Sunday mornings we've been going through the book of John, uh, doing a series I've entitled One Way, so John chapter 8, normally I've got a slide on behind me, but I guess we're running into an issue there, um, John chapter 8, I'm going to start reading uh, verse 1, read down to verse 11, then I'll pray. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again into the temple, and all the people came unto Him, and uh, He sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto Him a woman taken in adultery. And uh, uh, when they had set her in the midst, they said to Him, Master, This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? But, or excuse me, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, uh, being convinced by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left standing alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine... Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The title of my message this morning is Jesus, the only hope. Jesus, the only hope. And I hope that you'll see with me today as we break this passage down that this woman, her only hope was Jesus. There was nobody or nothing else that could help her in her situation And let's bow uh, for a word of prayer and and then we'll continue on. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for this time. I I pray that as we get into the message that our text this morning and Your Spirit would draw others closer to You. God, I want to see people drawn to You. I don't want anyone to walk out and say, wow, what a a great preacher or or even what a great message or even what a great church is as great as I think we are. Um, I, I want people to walk out of here today and say, wow, what a great loving God that has mercy on us. God, I pray you'd help me to say what you want said. Keep me from saying anything you don't want said this morning. God, help me to preach like a dying man to dying people. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. There was a judge in Michigan who uh, found himself in the news because of a violation of a courtroom rule. And uh, what happened next was kind of interesting. Judge Raymond Viatt, or Voet, had a long-standing policy forbidding the use of any electronic devices in his courtroom. Anyone whose phone would ring out, the phone would be confiscated on the spot, and they would receive a fine. Over the years, attorneys, police officers, witnesses, and even spectators had broken this rule and had their phone confiscated during the rest of that court hearing and had to pay a fine. During the closing arguments, though, of a trial, someone's smartphone went off one day. And the smartphone started saying something like, I can't understand you. Say something like, Mom, the phone requested. You ever had Siri come on when you're in a conversation and Siri just thinks that she needs to chime in with what you need to hear? Well, that happened during this court proceeding. Um, everyone had seen at this point now that it was actually the judge's new phone. I, and he must have bumped it or something and made it started talking loud is what he said. Um, but he said, I don't like those excuses from anyone. I don't like the excuses of I forgot. I don't like the excuses of uh, it just happened. He says, I set the bar high because cell phones are a distraction. And this is very serious business going on, the judge says. The courtroom is a special place in our community. It deserves more respect than that, the judge said. During the next 5-minute or 15-minute break they had in the trial, Judge Voet held himself in contempt, 
surrendered his phone and paid the $25 fine that he serves anyone else who disturbs a trial. Judges are human, Voet said. They are not above the rules. He said, I broke the rule and I have to live by it just the same. Ladies and gentlemen, there's none of us here today that, that have lived a life that's one of perfection. We've never lived a life without breaking a rule. And there's a penalty to pay. And uh, before I go any further this morning, I want you to understand with me that you have some options if you're not perfect and you know you're a sinner. First option is you can pay for it yourself. And where does that lead us? Well, Romans 6.23 is pretty clear that the wages of sin is death. So there's, there's, there, you can pay for it, but you're going to pay for it and serving in a flaming eternal hell the rest of your life. Or you can look at what the rest of that verse says about how God has given you eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can let Jesus be that only hope, the only payment that's going to be acceptable. So a few things here about our, in our text this morning about Jesus the only hope. We see number one, we see the interruption of activity here. We see this interruption of activity. So as, as Jesus is the only hope, we see that there's an interruption of activity. Look at verses 1-3 through three with me. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, it says here, early in the morning, and He came again into the temple. And all the people came unto Him, and He sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees, but by the way, when you see the scribes and Pharisees mentioned in Scripture, it usually means that these guys are the troublemakers, the guys that stir the pot. You ever know people like that? Every time they get on, they get on television, or they get on YouTube, or you see them at your job, they're always that one that likes to stir the pot. So the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her... And, and when they had set her in the, in the midst. So we're going to stop there. How many of us like interruptions? We see that Jesus gets up early, right? He's got His priorities. And they're where they're supposed to be. And He goes to the temple. And, and, and it says here that, uh, And all the people came unto Him, and He sat down and He taught them. So this wasn't just a 30-minute sermon. Jesus parks Himself right there, and He's going to be teaching for a little while. How many of us like interruptions? I know I don't, but Jesus deals with an interruption. He's teaching the people in the temple, and He has these interruptions. It's by the way, Jesus deals with interruptions better than any one of us. We see out of this interruption of activity, we see the steadfastness of Jesus. These leaders knew exactly where Jesus would be. Isn't it a, a good testimony when you know where there's... Uh, you know there's some people you can count on knowing where they're at. Uh, the church that uh, Mark came from before he uh, came here was a, a church I got baptized at when I was eight years old. And, and I can remember a story about a particular couple at that church. And there were people that broke into their house while they were in church because somebody had been watching them and they knew these people were gone betw between a certain period of time on a Sunday evening and that's when their house got broken into. So these... These people here, they come up to Jesus and they, they come up with something to interrupt His teaching. But in a moment, we will see that their attempt was also an attempt to not only interrupt Him, but to disrupt His ministry and cause it problems. They had no trouble finding Jesus as He was very predictable. In Luke 21, verses 37-38 tell us, And in the daytime He was uh, teaching in the temple, and at night He went out in a boat or was at in the mount which is called Olives, and all the people came early in the morning to the temple for Aaron. So Luke's account says the same thing. It tells us that he's steadfast, he's there. And if you serve, and if you try to minister to people like Jesus is doing here, uh, you're going to encounter people that want to hear about Jesus. We, we had th over 30, we had 37 kids come and go out the doors over the last week. I don't know about anybody else this morning, that's something to get excited about. Because it had been a couple of years since we were, were able to even put together a VBS. So our first time being rusty as a church, we get 37 kids here. That's, that's a, a time to say hallelujah and shout. And four of them decided to accept Christ and make that life-changing decision. But be rest assured, as, as great of a week as it was and how much fun you saw in the video, I can tell you that Satan was just as active and just a part of things as much as we were during that VBS. I don't have time to get into it, 
but I can tell you of situations starting all the way on Sunday night and going until even uh, Friday when we're cleaning up where Satan's showing up and he's trying to put a wrench into things. So if you so much as want to build a shed to be used for the gospel ministry, expect Satan to fight you every step of the way. You may say, that's extreme, Brother Josh. It's extreme, but I'm telling you, anything you do, if you try to sit your family down and do a devotion together, you try to read a book together as a couple, Satan's going to fight you. We see here not only the steadfast of Jesus during this interruption of activity, but we see the inconsistency of these troublemakers. So they, the, these rulers, religious rulers, I don't even like calling them that, they sit her down right in the middle of, of everything. They, they want all the attention focused on her, trying to shame her and whatnot. Middle of the crowd, all the shame and the humiliation, yet there's no explanation here of where the man is. And I think this is important to pay attention to real quick because the law required that both parties be stoned. You don't have an adulteress without an adulterer. So these guys sit the adulteress here and they're ready to hurl stones at her. And yet, here's what happens. We see that uh, there's an inconsistency here. They sit the woman down, but the man's nowhere to be found. And you may say, why is that important? Ex or Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10 says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, pay attention here, that the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. There's a word here that we need to pay attention to. It's called adultery. It's called adultery. So this woman was, or the man was married to somebody else. She may have been married to somebody else and, and she committed that act. If it was two single people, it would just be fornication. But here it is adultery. We need to understand that and understand how serious this is. This is a serious thing, but we see an inconsistency here because the man's nowhere to be found. Which tells us how messed up that the judicial system was here at this time. Now Deuteronomy 22.22 says, If a man be found lying uh, with a married woman to a husband, then they shall both of them die, but both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. So while Jesus' critics were correct of the law in one sense here, that Moses had given them, apparently the Jews of Jesus' day apparently did not enforce this law often. Some of this is because they're under Roman rule and they didn't allow executions. But also at this point, the sin of adultery had been overlooked. And if, and if you hang with me, we'll, we'll get to that. We see this, this interruption here. It's a very serious situation. But we're going to see here the interrogation from the critics. Listen, to the, number two, we see interrogation from the critics. Look at verse number four. Here in our text. They say unto him, Master, which in your Bible, Master, is, is probably capitalized. But these guys here are, are giving him a title, but they're really not that reverent about it. Master, this woman was taken in adultery, the very act. Which I want to stop there and say that there are some Bible commentators that will tell you, well, that's just an accusation that they made. I believe somehow she was caught because they're using this word adultery. Once again, where is the man? She's caught in the act of adultery. Verse 5, Now Moses and the law commanded us that uh, uh, such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What are you saying, Jesus? What do you say we ought to do? Do you agree with Moses or not? Verse 6, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. These critics here present the adulterous woman. And this adulterous woman, while she had her sin... She is being weaponized by these people trying to derail Jesus and derail His ministry. We see that there are no established facts here. The leaders here see clearly the sins in others, but are blinded to their own wretched sin. Do you know what it, what it means when uh, somebody's a, uh, uh, what's the word, a Pharisee? A.W. Tozer puts it this way. A.W. Tozer says 
that a Pharisee is somebody that's hard on everyone else and easy on themselves. So they're out there in the crowd. They're picking his sins. They're picking her sins. They're picking his sins. They're picking his sins and bringing that all to light. They're talking about everybody else's sins. But the one thing they don't want to talk about is their sin. Oh, I'm not that bad of a person is what they're saying. Don't talk about my sins. I'll talk about yours all day long. There's a couple places in Scripture that tells us that's a problem. Matthew 7 and Luke 6. I don't know, we don't have time to turn there this morning because I need to hurry. But it says in both of those accounts to cast the beam out of your own eye and not worry about the moat that's in your brother's eye. So we see here under our second point about the interrogation of the critics. They didn't have facts. and Instead, they're focusing on everybody else. And, and Jesus says way back in... Matthew 6, or excuse me, Matthew 7 and Luke 6, he says, you're looking at the little speck in your brother's eye, but you've got a big 2 by 4 sticking out of yours and you're hitting everybody upside the head with it. That's part of why we don't have revival in our nation. It's part of why, I'm going to say something that might get me in trouble this morning, it's part of why we don't have revival in our churches. Because we'll look at everybody else's sins, but are we going to weep over our own? Oh, you don't understand. I heard people say this. I was door knocking one time when I was an assistant. And I was a youth pastor in Springfield, knocked on a guy's door, and he said, Oh, you don't understand, sir. I'm not, I don't kill people, and I'm not as bad as that guy across the street that's cooking meth every night. He was very emphatic about it, and there was nothing I could say. These leaders were blinded. They were blinded by their own sins. They were blinded by rejecting Christ. They didn't have a desire for truth, as we see in verse 5. They weren't concerned with the adulterous woman. What is interesting here is that they were adulterers themselves. Jesus told them they were adulterers. Matthew 5 and verse 28 says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh upon a, a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The Ray Comfort goes around sharing the gospel. I was watching a couple of his videos not too long ago, and he goes through the, the Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery. And he, and he goes on there and he's talking to some younger people in their 20s. And he, this one girl was saying, well, I'm not a stealer. And I'm not this. And, you know, have you ever looked upon a man to lust? And she'd say, yeah, look at, look at my boyfriend over there. He's hot. And she thought she was being funny and cute. But in reality, he's, he's exposing the hey. We've got sins that have got to be dealt with, ladies and gentlemen. And these guys here didn't care about their sins being dealt with. They cared more about derailing Jesus' ministry. They cared more about their fame and their attention. They didn't care about people's lives being changed. And the moment we at Mount Zion Baptist Church lose a passion for souls, we're in trouble. There's some signs up here that kind of tell us where, where our mind and our heart need to be at. The lost matter most. Pray for the USA. Those were up here before I came here. And that's where our heart's got to be. Doing VBS, getting 37 kids here, seeing four decisions for Christ. That's showing where our heart's at. And that's a good thing. But the moment we lose heart, the moment we don't see souls as being precious and needing to be snatched out of the road that leads down to eternal flaming pit of hell, we're in trouble. If we don't evangelize, we will fossilize. If these men were so firm here in our text on what Moses gave them, they would have actually executed each other. Only Jesus offers hope where the law condemns. The law is important. I know some people say, well, we don't need to be teaching and preaching out of the Old Testament. You know, we've got some better stuff now. Really? I, I wouldn't know I was a sinner, ladies and gentlemen, if, if they would not pointed out to me starting in the Old Testament. Paul said that the law was a schoolmaster teaching us what sin looks like and how it is in God's eyes. And Habakkuk, I believe it's chapter 2, tells us about the character of God with sin. It says He can't so much look on it. So God can't even look on us outside of Jesus Christ. But if you have Jesus Christ, if you've surrendered to Him, and you've uh, admitted you're a sinner, you believe that Jesus died, was buried, rose again the third day, and you've asked Him to save you, and tell Him you believe that, then God can have a relationship with you. But you know what? You can't, you can't even read your Bible and get much out of it if you don't have that relationship. These guys we see in the first part of verse 6, 
They desired uh, conflict. This they said here, tempting him that they might uh, have to accuse him. Will Jesus agree with Moses? Is their question that this woman should be stoned? And then they, another thing, if so, if Jesus said, "Yeah, cast every stone that you can imagine at this woman. Yeah, get get rid of her." So if that happens, based on Roman law, that would place Jesus at odds against the Romans. So these guys think, we, we want to get rid of Jesus. Well, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to set her down in front of a whole multitude of witnesses. And we're going to see what Jesus says. Is Jesus going to say, yeah, take every rock from, from the sides of the road and throw at her? Well, if he says he's upholding Moses' law, aha, he's going to be in trouble with the Romans. But then if he just lets her off and just gives her a free pass, we know he's a fake and a phony. And no one will follow him. So they think they've got Jesus figured out here. What would happen to his reputation as the friends of sinners here? So they think they could expose him. Luke 11, 53 and 54 tells us, And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and provoked him to speak many things, laying in wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Some people thrive on conflict. You ever know anybody like that? I think we all know somebody. That that person there just loves to stir up trouble. They like to start arguments. They like to fight. They like to be a a fighter. If they ain't fighting, they ain't happy, right? You ever know anybody like that? What's sad is, this will probably get me in trouble too. I know some preachers that are like that. Get around them. They'll, they'll, They'll bring up something to stir people up. They know what gets under somebody's skin. And they will bring that up in their little preacher meetings. Which is why I don't go to very many. Which uh, brings me to a text that comes to mind. Of how should we be if we're preaching the gospel, if we're serving Jesus? Well, 2 Timothy 2.24 says that the servant of God is to strive to be gentle. You know, Mark's uh, pastor that he came from before he came here is a man that's gracious in, in every situation imaginable. His pastor is a man that, boy, when, when, when a lot of preachers will just blow their top and start going off on people, he's very kind and gracious. I've heard some of the... My, my dad goes to church there. My dad's told me how Pastor Metzinger's dealt with a few situations and it taught me a few things. Because on my own, I don't strive to be gentle without the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you sit with me in a car for very long, I'm asking somebody if, they're, if the light's green and I don't see positive movement, with the windows rolled up, of course, I'm saying, what are you waiting on? An invitation? Are you waiting for the pole to turn green? That's, that's not being gentle. I have to work on that sometimes. Some, you're laughing because it's like sometimes it's all the time, Brother Josh. I know. So, thirdly, we see here the ignoring of the critics. We see the ignoring of the critics. So we've seen the interference, interruptions, the interrogation here of the critics, and we see the ignoring of the critics. Look at, look at what Jesus did here in verse, the last part of verse 6. But Jesus stooped down, and with His finger wrote on the ground as though He heard them not. So when they uh, continued asking Him, He lifted up Himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And He stooped down, or, and again, excuse me, He stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. The ignoring of the critics. Jesus moves the moment here to Himself and away from the woman. He allows all their fury to be vented. He allows them to say, what are you going to do, Jesus? Yeah, Jesus, what are you going to do? You ever seen somebody like that? Somebody makes a comment, and usually it happens around kids. Somebody make a comment, and a kid will be like, yeah, so-and-so, what are you going to do now? That's what these guys are doing here in our text. One by one, they're like, yeah, yeah, we're just just doing what's popular. We're going to point something out here about Jesus. He's unruffled. In the words of... uh, one of my mentors, he doesn't even dignify it with a response verbally. He just gets on the ground and starts writing, which we'll get to that in a second. He moves his finger through the sand. We see here a quiet commitment to the truth here in 
verse 6, the second part, we see a citing of truth. In verse 7, there's no personal attacks from Jesus. There's no name calling. Jesus did not intend that the, did not intend that the uh, accusers needed to be sinless. The law didn't require that, but they had to be innocent of the particular sin that they were being accused of. So that's important for us to understand. Basically, Jesus is saying, like I said earlier, when they said, well, you look upon a woman, or He said, you, know, you look upon a woman to lust, you've committed adultery. Jesus is saying in your heart, you're no better and no different than this woman. You've got your own sins that need to be paid for. What did Jesus write? Well, no one knows for sure. Some believe it's uh, the Ten Commandments that Jesus started writing. Others believe that Jesus wrote one of the warnings that the prophets gave to Israel, warning them not to uh, engage in this kind of behavior and act this way. And all the prophets were warning Israel of coming judgment. So some think it's that. Exodus 31.18, this is why people think it's the law. Listen carefully here to what I'm going to read to you. And he gave unto Moses, and when he had made an uh, end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony... Tables of stone written with the finger of God. This is when the Ten Commandments was given. The law was given to reveal sin. The law wasn't given so that we could say, well, let's look at the law, and boy, if I can live up to things, I'm going to be somebody. Yes, sir, I'm going to be somebody if I could just live up to the law. That's not the whole point. It's about humility. It's about saying, God, I don't have an answer to this situation. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So Jesus is citing truth to them, which brings us now to this conviction of truth. Jesus starts out ignoring them and just writes out truth, then speaks directly, not to one person in particular here, He still ignores the answer that they want. But the answer... Or excuse me, but gives the answer that's true. Then writes again, this brought about what I call a paralyzing conviction. You ever had conviction that's so heavy on you, it just stops you in your tracks? You get so convicted about something you did or something you said, and you just can't go on. You stop right there. It keeps you from doing your activities of the day. Psalm 14, 40 verse 14 tells us, Let them uh, be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. That's what Jesus was doing to these people. They wished evil upon this adulterous woman. And Jesus puts the brakes on it. Which brings me to our fourth and last point this morning. The inspiration of Jesus. The inspiration of Jesus. Listen carefully and, and read along with me here. The last part of verse 9 and 11 through 11, we're almost done. Um, so they went out from the beginning to the eldest and to the last. And left, uh, Jesus was left alone standing in the midst. Jesus and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus uh, had, uh, when Jesus lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. We must not misinterpret this event this morning to mean that Jesus was easy on sin this morning or that He contradicted the law. We need to see that Jesus inspired this woman to go out and have a better, and have really not a better life, but actually have life, and inspired her to begin living in a way that would draw people to Him. Life is given here where the law takes. Without any prosecutors, Jesus dismisses the case. And this was right for Him to do, as He was the only one that could judge. Jesus offered something no one else could offer, which is life. Listen carefully to Luke 9, 54-56. And when His disciples, James and John, saw this, said, Lord, uh, what wilt Thou... uh, uh, Wilt Thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? So they said, Jesus, do we just are we going to pray down fire like Elijah did there on Mount Carmel that consumed their, the altars of Baal and consumed the prophets of Baal? Now well, Jesus didn't like that answer very much, or that question very much, because listen to what happens here. It says, but He turned and He rebuked them. It doesn't mean He turned nicely and, and had a, a 
a quiet conversation. He rebuked him like a kid that just took the cookie off the counter when mom tells him no. He rebukes him and, and, and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of? For the Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus ought to inspire us to do more this morning. Listen, I know we're tired from VBS, and after we rest, we need to get up and, and, and still work the fields. We need to get up and teach that next Sunday school lesson. We need to get up and, and invite that next person that needs to be brought here so they can hear the Word of God preached to them. We need to be looking for that next person that needs some love and some acceptance. There's a call here to repentance. Jesus did not say, go and live the lifestyle that, you're, that you think's okay, or He did not say, you know, go out and enjoy. Or as uh, one of my co-workers says, uh, don't just go away about your way rejoicing. But rather, He charges her. He challenges her. That says, in light of my forgiveness, I call you to live a life greater or higher than the sin in which you have lived. What would you do if somebody saved you from falling off a cliff? Would you just be shrugging your shoulders and walk away? You would be thankful that somebody kept you from falling down in a, in a pit or falling off a cliff somewhere. In fact, there are some theories of, of thought or religion you could say that teach you owe somebody a life debt if they saved your life. Romans 5, 20-21 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You may say, what does that mean? Listen carefully to the next words. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus had to take this lady's sin to the cross and would do so. That was the only way He could judge the way He judged here. He basically is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die for your sin. I'm going to die for your sin of adultery is what He's telling her here. He wanted her ready for that final judgment to come. Listen, mercy withholds what you rightly deserve, but grace gives you what you do not deserve. What can we learn from this account? We learn we must make sure that in hating sin, we first hate our own sin. It was revealed that the Pharisees did not hate sin at all. They were hypocrites, acting as though they had a passion for Moses' law. All this they did, here, all they did was expose their own hearts. In closing, there was a man who took a photo of, uh, of men stealing grapes. He went to the owner of the grapes intending to show him the evidence and found that the exposed photo was, too, uh, was exposed too long, excuse me, that the photo he was going to show them, it got, when he developed it, it got exposed too long and it had been blotted out. So it, it looked like nothing had happened. Likewise, God blots out the sin of those who come to Him for mercy and forgiveness, and only Jesus can offer hope of that new day and a new life. This woman here, by, by the law, yeah, should have been stoned. Jesus says, I come to offer life where the law comes to take. And this morning, you may say, I've never done anything that bad. I've never committed adultery. You may even say, I'm too young to commit adultery. But you know what? The, the problem is in adultery this morning as much as it's our heart. And is sin ruling and reigning in your heart today or is the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in your heart? It, it, it starts with a relationship with Him. It starts with coming to Him. And it comes to surrendering to Him. If you prayed to Him and asked Him to save you, you must have a moment in your life where you turn to Him for salvation. And, and you admitted... You're a sinner. You believed in what He did for you on the cross and you confess that. And you trust in it. On the other hand, this morning, maybe you're a believer. And you may say, Jesus is ruling in my life. I hope that He is. But maybe He's not. That's no reason to go out, the, out these doors discouraged because today, uh, I'm going to pray in just a moment and we'll be done. Because today you can walk out those doors and say, I'm signing up back up again. I am reaffirming my commitment to Him today. Let's pray.